there's two demands upon us with rationality. The first is to know the truth, the second is to avoid error. The idea by knowing the truth is to believe what's true or know what's true as opposed to believing something that's false. Also, to actually know some truths, not just to completely withhold belief, to actually claim knowledge on some things. Now in this pursuit of knowledge, in this pursuit of knowing the truth, James is asking the question whether we must always know that we know. <laughs> so that might get a little confusing. Well, he makes a distinction between knowing that you know and then just simply knowing. Now, what's perhaps surprising is uh, James says sometimes you, ha you know, but you don't know that you know, and that's all right. To understand what James is doing here, we have to put it in context. He's trying to make his way between Clifford and Pascal. Pascal offers what's been called Pascal's wager. And it's not exactly an argument for the existence of God. Rather, it's an argument that you should believe in God. It's not quite the same thing. So Pascal, in this argument, is not really offering any evidence for or against existence uh, or the truth, just merely the choice. So to illustrate what Pascal means, I mean, there are two possibilities. Either God exists, or God doesn't exist. And Pascal, according to Pascal, you have two choices. Either you uh, believe in God, or you don't believe in God. Now, suppose uh, you believe in God, and God exists. Pascal says, well, this is the best possible outcome. Because if you believe in God, and God actually exists, well, then you, you get an eternity in, in heaven. But if you believe in God, and God doesn't exist, there's no real consequence. Right? You simply lived a life of piety, and holiness, morality, and so what? Right? There's no bit, real big consequence either way. All right. Well, let's take the other one. Suppose uh, you don't believe in God, and God doesn't exist. There's still no real consequence. Right? Death is kind of the great equalizer for Pascal. Uh, whether you believe in God exists or not, uh, the consequence is the same, if God doesn't exist, namely, you know, nothing. Well, uh, suppose you don't believe in God and God does exist. That's the bad consequence, according to Pascal. If you don't believe in God and God actually exists, well, you get, uh, you know, an eternity in perhaps uh, the warmest of locations. And we looked at uh, Clifford in another video. So you know, reference that video if you want to get uh, the full explanation on Clifford's view. But it's important to remember that for James, he, he understands Clifford to be saying that you have to know that you know before you can assent to believe. And for uh, and according to James, what that means is that you have this uh, evidence that's objective, right? That's publicly available, and you have something like uh, an unwavering confidence in the belief before you can even act. Now James, James is going to reject this notion. He thinks that uh, there's going to be at least some times, not always, but at least some times where you're not going to have this objective evidence, and yet you still are allowed to assent. You are still allowed to believe. James thinks he's going to get out of this dilemma between uh, Clifford and Pascal. And to start on his way, he's going to make a distinction between a life hypothesis and a dead hypothesis. A hypothesis is just merely a belief that's proposed to somebody. Right? He's like, Here, believe this, right? That's a hypothesis. Now, a life hypothesis is one that the person is already kind of willing to accept. Doesn't have any problem with uh, even considering the possibility of that belief. A dead hypothesis is one that according to James, it's just not even going to be considered by the individual. Now it's important to remember that for James, uh, whether a hypothesis is alive or dead, is going to depend upon the individual, not upon evidence. For James, whether or not you uh, believe something or can't believe something, at first, in some ways, just depends upon what you're initially willing to believe to, just to begin with. So suppose I told you something like the following. Did you see that? There was a mermaid. You wouldn't believe me. There's no evidence that I could provi provide that, uh, there, that there are mermaids. You know, short of, I don't know, actually putting one right in front of you. Right? It's not, it's not going to happen. 
I could promise you all that I want. I could swear up and down that I saw a mermaid. You still wouldn't believe that there's a mermaid. And the reason why is you're not willing to accept that there's a mermaid pretty much from the beginning. This is a dead hypothesis. A hypothesis that you're just not willing to accept, at least not without you know, overwhelming evidence to the contrary. But suppose I told you something like this. Ooh, a dolphin. You wouldn't necessarily believe me right away, but the idea that there's a dolphin out there is at least possible. It's a live option. It's something that fits with what you already know about uh, the water, about the kind of life that exists out there. You don't necessarily have really great evidence for it. I, you know, I'm sitting here trying to spot it a far distance away, but it's at least a possibility. It's not a dead option, like a mermaid. So one reply we might have to James from the beginning regarding this live versus dead hypothesis business is that, you know, you're believing some things. You know, if you say something's a dead hypothesis or a live hypothesis, regardless of what evidence provided, uh, you're believing something without any evidence. I mean, Clifford would freak at this point. Like, Clifford would have a fit about this live versus dead hypothesis business. Now, James... Uh, provides an argument, or at least can provide an argument, saying, look, you know, if we demand uh, sufficient evidence uh, for all of our beliefs, as Clifford would have us do, we're going to run into a huge problem. So, you know, just suppose uh, it's true that all, uh, all knowledge or all belief must be justified uh, by some sufficient evidence. Well, there's, there's kind of a problem that pops up. I mean, if all belief must be justified by some evidence, well, then we've got either one of two situations. Either there's some belief that is justified by itself, and this is some, you know, some kind of foundation of belief, or we have uh, an infinite regress of belief. Now, what James is getting at here is, you know, even if we're presented with some evidence, we still have to consider you know, if we're given some evidence, we still have to believe the evidence, right? So then we need some sufficient evidence to believe that it's evidence, and so on and so forth. So that can get kind of sticky. Well, the way out of this, then, is to say, look, we got one or two possibilities. Either we have some belief that justifies itself, and then that belief is going to found everything else, right? It's going to justify everything else. Or we have an infinite regress of belief. Because if it's not a foundational belief, we... You know, if we have no foundational belief, then there's always going to be some kind of uh, regress of belief. Well, it's just simply impossible that we can have an infinite regress of belief. I mean, for, first of all, our minds are finite. Right? Our minds can't hold that much evidence. <laughs> we can keep going and going and going and going and keep looking and looking and looking. And looking. We'll never find uh, any kind of evidence for any knowledge whatsoever, including, you know, the initial claims. All right, well, then, let's try the other way. Suppose we have some kind of self-justified belief. But the only thing that works, and we talk about the whole history of philosophy, and James has talked about this, uh, talk, talks about this as well, but the only thing that really works is this uh, evidence that you, in fact, exist. You know, Russell's talked about this, Descartes talked about this. Even if everything around you is, is some kind of deception, you're at least having experiences. And if you're having experiences, then there's something having experiences, namely you. So there is there is this one belief. It's just simply in virtue of having experience. There is one belief that's foundational, one belief that you, from which you can start uh, that just can't be doubted, that you have, for which you have sufficient evidence, namely that you exist and you have experiences. Great. Right. But that belief alone doesn't justify much of anything else. Right? It's a really minimal belief. You exist and you have experiences. What do you get to infer from that? That you exist and you have experiences. You don't get to infer anything about your experiences telling you something about the world. You don't get to uh, infer anything that's even caused by anything else other than maybe your own mind. Right? So we saw some of this when we looked at Descartes and we looked at Russell. <clears throat> so what James is getting at here is if you, were, if you had this claim that all knowledge must be justified by sufficient evidence, right? Every belief must be justified by sufficient evidence. You're not going to have any knowledge whatsoever. And if you don't have any knowledge whatsoever, you fail at these rules for rationality because you fail to have at least some knowledge, you know, beyond this foundational belief. You fail to have any knowledge that there's an exterior world.
something that James points out right away, these rules are not equivalent to each other. It's just simply false that if you follow one, you're going to necessarily fulfill the other. So suppose you spent your whole life trying to avoid error. You could have the strictest standards of belief ever and not reach a single conclusion. Or you could just simply not believe anything in order to avoid error. But then that would mean that you don't know any truths because you don't know anything. On the same way, suppose you spent your whole life trying to know truth, but you maybe not are too picky about your uh, methods of evidence, right? I, uh, you could uh, know a lot of truths, you could accidentally stumble upon them. But you probably also believe a lot of false things too. So these rules, while they're important for rationality, they're not equivalent. If you follow one to, the, to an extreme, or exclusively, you're going to reject the other. So, uh, in addition to hypotheses, we, we also have these options. And James uh, looks at three kinds of options. And the first is, is live. So, a live uh, option is when you have two hypotheses and each of them is live. If one of them is, if you only have two options, if you only have two beliefs and one of them is dead, it's not a live option, right? Because you're not going to believe the dead option. All right. So, a live option is when you have two hypotheses and each of them is live. Okay. Next is forced. Forced is when you have two beliefs and they are contradictory. That means that you have to believe one and reject the other. If uh, each of them are, say they're just contrary beliefs, well, that's not forced because you can reject both of them. Right? You can only accept, you can at most accept one, but you can also reject both of them. Right? So that's not forced. You don't have to believe any one of them. I, with subcontrary, suppose the beliefs are subcontrary, you don't have to reject any one of them. Right? You, uh, suppose you have two hypotheses and they're, they're subcontrary, you don't have to reject one. You can believe both if you want to. Right? But you're not forced into uh, accepting one or rejecting the other. It's only when you have a belief, two beliefs that are contradictory. Uh, where if one is true, the other is false and vice versa. That's when you have a forced option. You're forced to accept one or the other. All right. And finally, momentous. It's where the belief has deep consequences. This is when the, the belief matters. When the hypothesis is important in your life. <clears throat> so you have the option to believe one or two hypotheses. And the decision between the two is going to affect the rest of your life. So... Here, you know, here's something that's not momentous, right? Uh, whether or not it's going to rain. That's not momentous. I mean, I might be forced to believe one of those. It's either going to rain or it's not going to. Okay, you know, those, that's kind of contradictory. But it doesn't make a difference in my life because I'm going to run to the car no matter what. Well, or go to, walk, go to my car no matter what. I don't have an umbrella for this. I'm just going back and forth to my car. It's 20 feet to my car, so what? So it's not momentous. Uh... So with these three options, you got live, forced, and momentous. When you have all three of these, you have what James, call, James calls a genuine option. A genuine option. Now, it doesn't mean that you know, it's actually an option versus another. It's genuine in the sense that this is going to affect, this is a matter of what you are. It's live, it's forced, and it's momentous. So here we have it. We have the question of what we should believe. Clifford says we should only believe that for which we have sufficient evidence. James has provided problems for that. So what, are we, so what does he say we should do? Well, it depends on whether or not the option to believe or withhold belief is genuine. If it's, remember, we have two rules, right? We have our two rules. Uh, to know the truth and to avoid error. And uh, sometimes those rules can conflict. Sometimes those rules can conflict. Okay. Well, if it's not a genuine option, if it's not a genuine option, uh, James says, avoid error. Right? Just avoid error. Okay. Uh, and, and the reason, is, so in that case, you can withhold belief, or you wait till you get some sufficient evidence, 
right? Wait till you get some, something that just really demonstrates the truth of, of one hypothesis over another. So, you know, if it's not a genuine option, then one of three things is going to be the case. Uh, it's either, either it's not going to be live, either it's not going to, or, or it's not going to be uh, forced, or it's not going to be momentous. If it's not live, uh, well, you, you kind of, if it's not live, then you're pretty much not going to go anywhere to begin with. You're not going to consider the other option to begin with. Right? So you don't need to uh, subscribe to it. Right? You, you can just hold on to what you already believe. If it's not forced, you don't need to uh, believe one or the other right then and there. You can wait for the evidence. Right? You can withhold belief from, from one or the other. You know, if, it's, if it's not forced, it's not contradictory. You can either withhold belief or subscribe. It doesn't really matter at this point. Or it's not momentous. And if it's not momentous, who cares? Right? Just, just withhold belief until you have that sufficient evidence. If you never have the sufficient evidence, so what? It's not going to affect your life. Okay. So if it's not genuine, avoid error. That's the rule to follow. Avoid error. But... If it is a genuine option, James says, you side with knowing the truth. You follow that rule, and you risk error. You risk error. So if it's genuine, one of two beliefs is going to be the case. One or two beliefs are live for you, but each holds a real possibility. And you're forced to believe one or the other. You can't hold on to both. You're forced to have one or the other. Even trying to withhold belief is the same as saying it's false for James. Even withholding belief is the same as saying it's false. So uh, even if you try to say, well, I'm going to withhold belief in, in favor of uh, you know, the, this idea of waiting for sufficient evidence, it's the same thing as believing it's false without sufficient evidence. So James says, even if you do something like this, you're still acting contrary to the rule. So for James, some people, at least some of the time, are going to have genuine options in terms of belief. They're going to have, there's going to be some questions that are not going to be subject to, the, to this demand of certitude that Clifford has given us. For those people with these genuine options, they have the right to believe. And they have the right to believe as they see fit.